99.7 K-Red. Hey, we need to step the f*** up, man. Aurora, Colorado. Don't so that feel good when your crowd behind you? You know what I'm saying? Let's give them something to cheer for now. Hey, 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 this is You're now listening to the sounds of... Running Wild with Brandon Jackson. I love defense. You want points on the board, move the... Aurora. See what that gets you. Three points in a conference game. In seven months to explain your quarterback. into that one oh this is brandon jackson 99.7 k red aurora running wild with you guys i'm probably gonna get a lot of heat for that one but uh i mean it's the truth that whew, defense looked terrible in that game and they got torn up they really couldn't score and uh yeah that is an embarrassing loss to new mexico state after coming off a pretty tight game against a number 24 ranked Miami team, there, there, there's really no excuse for that whatsoever. There isn't. So I, I've got nothing to say as I'm still kind of queuing up some stuff here in the background. If you hear me clicking, uh, yeah. How, how are we doing everybody? Cause, uh, it's been a nice, uh, long two weeks off for everybody to just kind of settle down uh, a two-week bye is, is not bad when you kind of need to regroup after such a whooping like that uh, from New Mexico State. There, honestly, there's no there's no real positives. I mean, what what can we talk about? That was a positive in that one. Winsley got over 100 yards running, so I mean that's that's good, I guess. But you know what what good does it do for you if it's not um, getting the team wins? So sure. Winslet is proving that he can be just as effective as a runner as uh, Timberlake, and maybe uh, there should be more split on the carries uh, for Winslet to kind of get in there. But, uh, I mean, outside of that, I mean, Mike Hayes has an arm. Uh, Chuck Oferije got his first touchdown. I guess those are the positives. But other than that, this it's a really bad game. A really bad game overall. They couldn't tackle Nick Jonte at all. It, it was... Larry Rose III was almost a non-factor, and yet Nick Jonte just completely tore up the entire Aurora defense. It was embarrassing. He, they couldn't tackle him. It was almost as if the man was just covered in oil slick. And anytime they tried to put a hand on him, slip right off a tackle, slips right off the tackles. I, you would have swore that this was a high school JV team. You ever see the commercial with Cam Newton, and he's like lined up, behind like that uh that high school team and he just like runs through everybody and like <laughs> makes outstanding plays that's what it looked like it looked like we were playing cam newton and we were a high school jv football team it's very bad so back to the drawing board again for uh coach mashburn and uh this aurora offense that really really needs to get it together this year it almost feels like they've taken a step back uh, Mashburn has kind of gone over things with Kierkegaard. It seems like the protection for the run schemes are, are fine, but the protection for the passing schemes aren't, aren't working. And one of the things that Mashburn and Kierkegaard really kind of drew up together this year was going into heavier sets to create more protection. And it seems like when they go under center with the quarterbacks, things have kind of fallen back a bit. So, from what I've heard from Mashburn and Kierkegaard, the plan is going into this week to dial back a little bit more on staying under center and put the quarterbacks in shotgun and pistol formations because that was what was pretty effective going into last, uh, sorry, from last year. And I think that having to mix it up a little bit more between being under center and doing seven step drops and then, you know, kind of going back to being in the shotgun and not dropping back at all. Uh, has affected the offensive line play. So, I, I mean, we'll, we'll see. They've had two weeks to kind of figure this whole thing out. And, uh, you know, a lot has happened since then. We had the uh, first week of high school football um, and the uh, uh, division that uh, all the teams at Mashburn are taking a look at uh, have competed in. So we'll get into that in the uh, second portion of the program. So please do stay tuned for that much of it as uh, 
There are a lot of great games this week that we'll be going over. So let's go ahead and hop into questions as uh, we're showing the practice live on uh, on uh, the website right now. So if you're taking a look and you have questions for next week, please do not forget to leave them in the comment section as I uh, go through them now. First comment here is from PSID412. He says, hey, Brandon, Peter here from Bristol, England. Do you think the reason Aurora did so badly against New Mexico State was that they believed that they were good against Miami, uh, Florida, that they could beat the Aggies without really trying? Hashtag run wild. Run wild. I don't, you know, I mean, that's, that's an interesting point because they did come all the way from, I mean, maybe there's fatigue that's a factor in that too. They came all the way from Miami, where I'm sure they probably had a fun time out there and everything. And especially after coming so close to winning that game, uh, coming all the way back and then having to play New Mexico State again on the road. I mean, that's a huge road trip. And then to have to go back out on the road against New Mexico State there. Um, you know, I, I don't want to say that that's the reason why. I mean, it, you know, you can only blame rest so much in that situation because it's not like they didn't, you know, it's not like they don't have time to prepare for that game. Um is it a piece of it? Maybe they did think that they could go in and beat the Aggies. I certainly had that attitude where I was like, oh, they're going to go in and crush New Mexico State. Um, but no, it turned out that the Aggies were really ready for us. And uh, they, they kind of played out of their minds in that game. And hopefully that this week they, uh, you know, they're going up against Troy. They did beat Troy last year, but I don't know. After looking at the New Mexico State game, uh, uh, I'm not I'm holding my breath a little bit here so we'll see how it goes next question here comes from Mitchell Skaney is how I'm gonna say that uh, I apologize if I got your name wrong but uh, his question is uh, is Mashburn concerned after being dealt with a fairly convincing uh, being dealt with very convinc fairly convincingly or uh, has he washed his hands of this game and has his focus been on the upcoming game also, what does Mashburn need to do to revitalize the pass game? Does he think of running a dual quarterback system from the 6-1-3? Run wild. It's run wild. Okay. I'm going to play my game of what is the zip code. 6-1-3 is area code. I don't want to know about. Oh, all the way from Ontario, Canada. All right. So we got a international flavor here today. We've got uh, England on the board and we've got Canada on the board. So... Yes, Mashburn is – it was definitely a concern for him what happened in the past game, especially with the defense doing such a poor job of containing the run game. Uh, so there's a lot of focus on the defense this week and a lot of pressure on defensive coordinator Spencer Bruce as well as he was kind of under fire last year. And I don't know if that means, you know, that it could be even worse for him this year, especially after a game like that. Um, he really, really wants to hammer home – defending the run because that's what made them so successful uh against miami and it was a huge problem against new mexico state and resulted in such a huge blowout now mashburn in terms of the offense may be going a little bit back towards a dual quarterback system so um maybe having uh, at least from what i understand from him is that on certain drives uh, maybe having DeSeuss in, maybe having Hayes in, maybe having Gaines in, maybe taking another look at Leventhal. Uh, kind of similar to what happened in that game where uh, Aurora picked up their first ever win when they played, uh, uh, what was it, Georgia State? Georgia State, yes. Uh, so maybe that's may, uh, that may be perhaps what they're going to be doing this week and uh, trying to fix that passing game to get it going. There's still going to be a lot of focus on the run. Mashburn is Mashburn and Kierkegaard desperately want to get this passing game going, but right now they know that they don't have the tools to really do that. There are certainly weapons there, but if the protection doesn't hold up, then how do you really get it going? So there's certain things that they're and certain things and certain schemes that they're trying to put together to get that uh, all in motion. And I suppose that we'll see what they actually have in plan when the week starts. Here we go. Last question here. I'll take from Johnny M. This question is, will uh, Aurora change the defense to a 3-3-5 or 4-2-5 as a lot of colleges nowadays tend to run the nickel against option offenses? Well, 
we the base is still the 3-4 defense which is what they like to stay in for uh, two wide or three wide formations we have been seeing a lot more of that nickel 2-4-5 look from them so they'll just have the defensive ends uh, like Andre Swift and uh, Rangi Unatoa in with no defensive tackles and just have uh, four linebackers out there and then have uh, Ishmael Finn Michaels in there as the nickel uh, or to play the slot receiver or, you know, to play as a spy or whatever they need him there for. But uh, I, I don't think the defense is going to do a firm change to like a 4-2-5 or 2-4-5 or 3-3-5 for that, uh, that matter. I think there's going to still be like that 3-4 front that they want. They want that front seven to get as aggressive as possible. Uh, right now, it hasn't come together, and that's things that they, you know, that he's talking about with Spencer Bruce. Uh, but I don't know. I, I really don't know what's in the cards right now for the defense. Other than that, um, there's going to be a heavy focus on defending the run um, and really, really hammering in, tackling, and securing guys. Thank you all so much for your questions. I look forward to what questions you guys have next week, and hopefully we have a way better output and performance. Uh, we're going to take a quick break here, and then we're going to get into high school football around Colorado, as well as recruiting battles that we're currently in and how that's all going. It's 99.7 K-Red. Brandon Jackson, Aurora, be right back. 99.7 K-Red, Aurora, Colorado. This is Brandon Jackson back with you for the K-Red Show. Running wild as we talk some high school football. We had a great set of games this past week. Littleton versus Denver. And if you're following online, you can see some of the action that we have. We have full archives of the games as well. As Denver's running back, Akeem Payton, runs off a big run there. And then here's the quarterback, Bailey Kennedy for Denver. Showing off what he can do on the ground here. Picking up 20 yards. And then later on, a little toss play here to the powerful running back, Akeem Payton. He would have his way with this Littleton defense, putting up a total of 181 yards on the ground. Mondrasso here on second and goal. He's going to get his work done on the ground, too. He would use, have to use a lot of his legs today as he gets in for Littleton's first touchdown. And we would have a bit of a shootout here in Denver. Later on, 7-7 to go, a uh, 7-7 game. Uh, later on, the first quarter. And look at that catch there by Parker Merville, the tight end. Great throw by Bailey Kennedy. See him towards the sideline and just an outstanding attempt to go ahead and make that catch. Later on, 14-10 ball game. Denver up by four. And look at Hakeem Payton continuing the rush. He would actually get over 100 yards on that carry in the first half. Outstanding game for him. Mondrasso later on, though, trying to throw deep downfield, looking for a receiver, instead gets picked off. That is the safety there, Revan Murphy, who's a junior. Mashburn may be taking a look at him next year and see what he can do. And then Bailey Kennedy later on. Going ahead and getting to his fullback, Paul Hill, after the turnover. And Denver surprisingly up on a favorite this year, Littleton, 21-10 early. Later on in the third, 21-13, here's Kane Frazier, one of the top wide receivers here in Colorado. Aurora looking kind of ahead on the race for him right now uh, as they need some dynamic playmakers there. And then here on the read option, Johan Mondrasso taking it to the end zone. 21-yard run for him. Again, another prospect high on the radar for Mashburn this year, and they're trying to see if they can bring him in as well, maybe as a uh, substitute for Hayes. And on the two-point conversion, here it is. He finds Quentin Ray on the outside. So a 21-21 ball game. Later on, Hakeem Payton still running strong as Denver's up by three. He gets 12 yards there on that run. And then straight to the end zone, Hakeem Payton. Way too easy for him. You clear a hole for him, and he only has to run one yard out. He'll definitely get it. 31-21, Denver up. Later on, here's Mondrasso still working, trying to get a comeback here if he can in the fourth quarter. He starts off here with another reception here by Cam Frazier. Look at the footwork getting off of the press coverage there by Landon Anazira, the safety, and then trying to get into the end zone. And then here, little run up the middle with Skylar Ferris. Nice handoff there. And a touchdown to put Littleton uh, into a possessions reach. Screen pass here as Denver trying to add to their three-point lead and keep Littleton away. A screen pass there for Payton doesn't go too far as he can't power passing at the first down. So here comes Mondrasso, a critical third down there, picks it up, 
as he gets it short to Ray. I mean, that was a quick pass. And then third and seven here from Andrasso, stepping up in the pocket, throwing across his body and completing that pass across midfield to Quentin Ray. As he finds him again there for an 11-yard reception. And then here is a controversial third and seven play here. Mondrasa going to drop back here. Throws underneath, and then Landon Anazira again there makes the play. Big tackle to stop Courtney Dixon short, or so we thought. And now it would go under replay as it was originally set to be a fourth and one. And the tackle here, when we look at the replay, it does look like he is indeed short. But the referee would come back with the results of what he saw from the play and would overturn the ruling, awarding Little to send the first down and not having them have to pick up that extra yard. So, second and goal later on. Here's Mondrasso, throw to the outside, touchdown. And Mondrasso putting together a great drive there to come back and bring his team down from a two-possession game and take the lead, 35-31. Stepping up in the pocket here, Bailey Kennedy heaving towards the end zone with 25 seconds left, an unnecessary pass. Picked off by the sophomore Jabari Bowen. He was the freshman last year who made that outstanding diving interception. Saved the game for Littleton last year going up against Greeley. And that ends it, 35-31. Mondrasso, 41-50 on passing, 421 yards, a touchdown and an interception. Two TDs on the ground. Frazier had six receptions and 68 yards. Four receptions and 60 uh, yards for Aiden Aldridge. And then junior Shevlin Jeffries, eight receptions and 70 yards, uh, 70 yard, 75 yards for him. Bailey Kennedy, 15 of 22 through the air, 207 yards, a touchdown, and an interception. Off to Aspen we go. Durango versus Aspen in a rematch of the state championship from last year. It's a different Durango team and most of, mostly the same Aspen team, especially on defense. They're still as tough as ever as they force a three and out on the first drive against Durango's new sophomore quarterback, Mason Hodges, taking over for Mike Hayes. Here's a look at the new quarterback for Aspen, Jackson Ripper, number 17, sliding down here as he picks up the first down. And then, and then Aspen going play action here and showing off a little bit of the arm. Jackson Ripper ripping one down to Kelvin Craig, his tight end. 34-yard gain there. Showing good poise there on the rollout. And then a laser throw. I mean, that was pretty much the only place it could go there. And then here's a handoff from Jackson Ripper to their outside linebacker. And running back, he does double duty. Bryson Mitchell getting in. Plays kind of a fullback uh, ro uh, sorry, uh, uh, role in his rugby team as well as a runner. As um, Hodges here throws underneath to Joey Hammett, the junior running back. And then Hammett here runs it in from the goal line. One yard out, touchdown. And we have a tie ball game here. Durango supposed to look a little weaker this year, but then all of a sudden, they started to take over this game. Mason Hodges here on the read option picks up eight. And then on the next play, Joey Hammett. Look at him get to the perimeter and look at the speed and acceleration. Zion Meadows not able to get there in time to tackle him, and he gets into the end zone from 41 yards out. And then, next possession for Aspen. Jackson Ripper on first and 10, throws a pick. That's a costly play there. As on the next play, Hodges throwing, showing you how to get it done to the sideline, finding his wide receiver, Teddy Bowers. A gain of 26 there. And then Hodges here on second and three, gonna call his own number and gets into the end zone. Touchdown Durango as they found themselves up by two scores, 21-7. Later on in the game, though, fourth quarter, 2.30 to go. 28-14, two possession game still. And then look at that. Jackson Ripper showing off the arm as he got Trey Meyer wide open down the seam. And he just lets it fly. I mean, that's too easy. You're asking for, you're basically begging for him to throw it. Durango's defense had done a great job up to that point. And then here's the kickoff after the touchdown. Fumbled. On the ground, Aspen picks it up and recovers and immediately gives themselves a chance to go ahead and tie this game. Jackson Ripper throws and finds Earl Blankenship for the touchdown, and we have a tie ball game. It would go into overtime there in Aspen. Second and goal here. And here's Mason Hodges, gonna call his own number again and runs it in, touchdown. 
a better runner than Hayes as the offense is changing a little bit here for Durango. And then look at the defensive play here to force the fumble and end it in overtime as Durango recovers 35-28. Mason Hodges, 25 to 29 through the air, 215 yards, a costly interception late in the game. 62 yards on the ground and then five rushing touchdowns. Joey Hammett, four carries for him, 47 yards, three TDs on the ground, and then seven receptions for 73 yards, showing off some of his catching ability. And defensive end Harmon Murphy with seven tackles, four tackles for a loss and two sacks for Durango. On the Aspen side of things, pretty quiet from Zion Meadows, as well as Rogue Jones Carter and Jackson Ripper through the air, 25 34, 25 34, 203 yards, two TDs, an interception, 15 carries for 52 yards, and a touchdown. St. Joe's versus Moore, it's all about Demarcus Moore, the former wide receiver for St. Joe's, the lefty getting it done here as he throws for Herbert Bauer to the, towards the end zone and then showing you off some of the arm strength that he has as he finds his wide receiver David Gray jumping up to go ahead and make that grab. What a play by the sophomore as he's showing off some of the special ability that he has. Maybe somebody that Mashburn looks at later down the year. Uh, later down the years. And then Demarcus Moore again here, 17-14 ball game, second quarter, winding seconds, throws underneath, finds his man, Alton Brooks, touchdown. And then Demarcus Moore also shows you he can get it done by himself with his legs. He ducks in and avoids contact and gets into the end zone. St. Joe's wins this one, 31-28. Demarcus Moore, great game from him. No interceptions. 19 of 25 through the air, 246 yards and a touchdown. Oh, sorry, and three touchdowns, one on the ground. 10 rushes for 22 yards. And David Gray, five receptions, 100 yards. He got a buck and one touchdown. Safety Nate Anthony, three tackles for him as he didn't get a lot on offense today. And then DeMonta Petaway, uh, sorry, DeMonta Petway Jr., four of eight in that running attack of more 70 yards, two passing TDs, 22 rushes, 145 yards, and a TD on the ground. Cooper weigh in with seven carries and 67 yards, a full back that Mashburn is trying hard to recruit after. And then Riley Porter, eight rushes, 38 yards, and a touchdown for the junior. And now, last but not least, the game at Pueblo. It's Colorado Springs going up against Pueblo, and we get our first look at Troy Fernandez Kyle, the new quarterback there for Pueblo. He's a junior and he throws a great touchdown pass there in the first quarter. And then Robert Wayne Lee for Colorado Springs taking over the quarterback role for Bryson Hill as he gets his first passing touchdown and in his first run. And it looked like Colorado Springs was gonna run away with this one, 28 to 14. And then all of a sudden in the third quarter, Pueblo decides they wanna come back into this one. There's Fernandez Kyle throwing to Robin Newell as Fernandez Kyle gets his second CD of the game. And then Robert Wayne Lee, who had played pretty sharp up to this point where he throws an interception towards the right sideline. A decent return here, puts Pueblo in great field possession. And then Fernandez Kyle throwing. Look at that, the Vinny Whitel across the middle. He had a decent game, five receptions, 64 yards. Just couldn't find the end zone. And then Fernandez Kyle, screen pass here for Kyron Glitch Johnson. He gets in from seven yards out, showing you off the hands that he has. Didn't have a great game on the ground, but he did get two touchdowns altogether. One on the ground, one through the air. And then a handoff here to Marshall Bowser as it seemed like uh, Pueblo was going to come back and win this one. And the fourth quarter puts it away 35-31. Kyron Johnson, 11 rushes, 37 yards, and a touchdown. Four receptions and 13 yards, and a receiving touchdown. And then for Robert Wayne, 27 of 33 through the air, 257 yards, a passing touchdown and an interception, seven rushes, 24 yards, and two TDs. And then the junior safety, A.C. Ward, had five tackles, and James Davis, uh, the a hugely recruited guard that Mashburn is looking at, uh, helped power that offensive line to create 200 rushing yards for Colorado Springs in their win. So let's go ahead and talk about the recruiting board. 
So here's how things are looking thus far in recruiting for Mashburn and Aurora. There's a tight contest right now with Colorado for Tyrone Robinson, but Aurora is still in it. Johan Mondrasso getting really tight with Wyoming. Aurora still in that race. Hakeem Payton starting to pull towards Utah, but still Aurora, the number two school, Jones, uh, Jordan Jones Carter. Uh, there's still a competition for him, the big tackle. Uh, Cam Frazier, we're in the lead. Starting to get some separation away from Cal. And then James Davis, the big guard who I mentioned in that Colorado Springs game. Seems like we're in sole possession of him. Just got to pull away and get him to sign. Roe Jones Carter as well, the defensive end. Seems like we're pulling away with him. Karuga Konyange, also uh, a good multifaceted back. We're in the lead for him, as well as quarterback Courtney Davis from Fort Collins. You have outside linebacker DeAndre Davis, a huge hitter right here in Aurora. We're still in the lead for him right now. Colorado neck and neck. Cooper Wayan, or Cooper Wyan, the uh, fullback. Still in a tight three-man three race for him. Jacob Lachlan, the receiver for Aurora. Still looking at him. Nate Anthony, we're in the lead for, but not making a lot of progress quite yet. Aiden Aldridge, the wide receiver from Littleton. We're still competing for Chad Morris. We're still competing for. We're in first place with him. Landon and Azir are also first school right now, looking like a roar for him. But we have fallen out of the race for a few guys, like William Weicker, the corner, Kyron Johnson, Monticello Jefferson, the punter, Vinny Weidel, Zion Meadows, Ethan Iredell. And it seems like those guys are completely out of the question, and Mashburn has pretty much, for the most part, let them go and taken them off the board. It's also looking at cornerback Vince Moore to kind of fill that role of the cornerbacks that he hasn't been able to get, like Zion Meadows and Riker. You got Vincent Meeks, the outside linebacker, right here from Greenwood Village, Colorado, and kicker Ed Garcia. So that'll take care of recruiting for this week. We'll have more high school football action as the week goes on and i look forward to talking with you on the next k red show thank you for tuning in this is brandon jackson 99.7 k red aurora running wild i'll see you next time